Good afternoon and welcome to the Celebrating Women's Suffrage and the ongoing campaign for voting rights talk, virtual talk. My name is Ann Agee and I am the Interim Dean of the University Library. We're so glad you could join us today and we're excited to have Dr. Patina Aptekar presenting with us. First, we're gonna start off with some housekeeping before Provost del Casino induce, introduces our guest speaker. Please note that this webinar has live closed captioning and you can access this tool by clicking the CC button on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please be aware that we're also recording today's event and we'll post the recording and presentation once it's done on the library's website, YouTube and Vimeo accounts. Following the presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. Please submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the Q&A button on your toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please note that there may not be time to answer all of the questions we receive, but we will try and get to as many as we can. Before we begin, we would like to make a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the land on which San Jose State University is located and was once the traditional home of the Puchon Ohlone speaking people and the present day Muwekma Ohlone tribe. The Puchon Ohlone were missionized into both missions Dolores and Santa Clara. The present day Muwekma Ohlone tribe is comprised of all known surviving Native American lineages aboriginal to the San Francisco Bay region who trace their ancestry through the missions San Jose, Santa Clara, and Dolores, and the historic federally recognized Verona Band of Alameda County. In the Muwekma Ohlone language, Cochenyo, Muwekma means the people. Without them, we would not have access to this gathering. We take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Provost Vincent Del Casino. Oh, Dean Agee, thank you so much. And it's a real pleasure to be here to, to welcome everyone to this event. Um, and I have to thank everybody, especially Dr. Bettina Optikar, for taking the time to do this. Um, you know, as you can imagine, this was originally scheduled for earlier in the year, but we really wanted it to happen in 2020 because this experience, this talk today, ties into a larger physical and virtual exhibit that's being held in the San Jose State University Martin Luther King Library Special Collections and Archives. And that exhibit is titled 100 Years of Women's Suffrage in the South Bay. This, this account features archival materials covering the local origins of the women's suffrage movement and traces the roots to the present day. While Silicon Valley is known for its role in leading the technology industry, the South Bay area also led the way for women in pioneering positions in local government and business. So it's with great gratitude that I welcome Dr. Padina Aptekar today, who is willing to participate in this virtual event. As a renowned activist, feminist, professor, and author, she has a long um, and prestigious career that has allowed her to do many things, including assisting in the defense of Angela Davis in the 1970s. What's so exciting as well is, is that Dr. Abdekar has ties directly to San Jose State University, having received her master's degree in communication studies here in 1974. She taught here as well in speech and communication, and she lectured in women's studies and Afro-American studies um, in the late 1970s when she then entered what probably was one of the most incredibly and sort of courageous PhD programs to emerge out of Santa Cruz, the History of Consciousness program, where so many incredibly brilliant people have received their doctorates, including Dr. Aptekar in 1983. She's taught a wide range of courses on sex and power, the Afro-American women in history and women in work. And not surprisingly, you will find Dr. Aptekar in the pages of our own Spartan Daily from the 1970s when she talks about writing her thesis and the project of exploration of the history of Afro-American women. You know, 
out of this, then we also get a lot of really interesting conversations um, where Dr. Abdekar talks about the intersection of her research and its influence on her teaching. So her work and her, and her dissertation, her thesis work on Afro-American women in history led to a course. In similar ways, later in her book, Intimate Politics, she talks about teaching sex and power at San Jose State University. And to quote that, she says, departing from a single traditional textbook that emphasizes a sociological approach to women in society, I introduce poetry and stories into the syllabus, as well as greater racial diversity, especially using the literature of black women writers. I allowed students to talk about their personal experiences and how those related to the books and stories, poems and plays we were reading. To, we were reading. It's that sort of pedagogical approach that emerges out of feminism and critical race theory that informs a lot of the pedagogy we see today, particularly that coming out of ethnic studies. So it's so exciting to see her here. As an author, she has a long list of books, including the titles Women's Legacies, Essays on Race, Sex, and Class in American History, the book Intimate Politics with the post colon, which is great, How I Grew Up Red, Fought for Free Speech, and Became a Feminist Rebel, The Morning Breaks, The Trials of Angela Davis, Tapestries of Life, Women's Work, Women's Consciousness, and the Meaning of Daily Experience. And she's currently working on a book titled Queering the History of the Communist Left in the United States. It is so exciting to have her talking today about suffrage on the eve of what is a very significant election. And she will be talking about that suffragist history. It's intertwined with racism, white supremacy, lynching, settler colonialism, and anti-immigrant insularity. And we know at this point in time that democracy is more fragile than ever. And so having conversations about the restriction of voting rights and the threats to democracy, the removal of tens of thousands from voting polls and the punitive sanctions that existed are incredibly important and pressing today. So I wanna thank you for attending this event. I wanna very much thank Dr. Bettina Optikar for being here. I hope that you take her words to heart and get out there and no matter what you do, vote in this election. With that, let me please turn it over to our presenter. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> um, I am delighted to be with you today. And I would like to uh, thank uh, the Provost Del Capacino for a wonderful and thorough introduction. And I want to also thank uh, Craig Simpson and Katie Steffens for their invitation to uh, participate in this wonderful celebration of the centennial of women's suffrage. And as the provost said, we had originally planned to do this uh, in March. And our date was literally just a couple of days after everything shut down with the pandemic. So I'm so happy we are able to meet now, um, albeit in this virtual world. I welcome everybody. I thank you all for coming. And I would like to also thank Mariah and Justin for their technical assistance as we put this uh, program together today. <clears throat> so the century long struggle for women's suffrage is incredibly inspiring, showing us the undaunted courage and perseverance of thousands of women. It was also arduous and the story complicated with many historical strands, internal debates, tensions and ruptures. And this also makes it thrilling and gives us a way to think about our history, especially in its context today. In our limited time, mindful that we are holding this event less than two weeks before what I think everyone agrees is the most consequential presidential election of our lifetimes, I want to focus on what I believe to be the most important of those strands in this historical telling. That is my focus will be on the ways in which voting rights for women were always and inexorably intertwined with black voting rights. 
I will share some stories from that history and share some slides that I hope will enliven our time. I will also show how communities of color joined the suffrage campaign, even while they were denied voting rights until much later in the 20th century. Then I will conclude with some thoughts about the ongoing battle for voting rights today. Although most people mark the start of the woman suffrage movement at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, the actual first call for woman suffrage was made in 1837, the conference of the Female Anti-Slavery Society in New York. This is why it matters. Unlike the American Anti-Slavery Society that was predominantly led by white men, however courageous and well-intentioned, the Female Anti-Slavery Society was founded to establish women's equal voice in the crusade against slavery. Women were not allowed to vote in the American Anti-Slavery Society until pressure to do so seven years after its founding, and black men and women were not in large numbers. In contrast, from its beginning, the female societies were co-established by white and black women working together. Moreover, all black women's movements against slavery were also established, such as the National Negro Convention and the Vigilance Committees. While the preeminent black abolitionist Frederick Douglass launched his own newspaper, The North Star. These multiple formations speak to the tensions within the movement, tensions produced by underlying white supremacist assumptions and by the profound legal and cultural norms that constricted women's lives. For example, in addition to being denied the right to vote, we sometimes forget about this because there's been such an expansion of women's rights uh, and women's equality in our lifetimes. But in the, in the 19th century, not only were we denied the right to vote, married women were quite literally the property of their husbands. And women and girls were the property of their fathers and sons or, or fathers and their eldest male relative. Indeed, in the 1830s, women and girls who worked in the New, New England textile mills, for example, found their wages paid to their husbands or fathers. Married women were not permitted to divorce their husbands. In the case of divorce by a husband, women lost custody of their children and they lost their homes. Domestic violence was legal. Women were not expected to speak in public and chastised for doing so. They were not expected to sign petitions and their access to education, employment, and property ownership was severely encumbered. Under these conditions, the first wave of women suffrage women, white and black, and the abolitionist women took enormous personal risks when they engaged in that anti-slavery movement. And that anti-slavery movement by, by 1860 had a combined membership of 200,000. That is, it's important for us to know that that abolition movement was a mass movement in this country. Among the early white abolition and suffrage women were Angelina and Sarah Grimke, who were from a South Carolina slaveholding family and had fled to the North. Susan B. Anthony, whose home was a station on the Underground Railroad. Elizabeth Cady Stent, Lucretia Mott, and Lydia Maria Child. Among the black women were Sojourner Truth, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who was a poet and novelist, the sisters Harriet and Sarah Purvis from Philadelphia, and Sarah Garnett, a renowned educator from Brooklyn, New York, among thousands of others. All of these women also became advocates for women's suffrage precisely because of their experience in the anti-slavery movement. It was in that movement that women learned organizing skills, became renowned public speakers, and published writers and journalists. Early in the 20th century, the struggle for women's suffrage intensified, beginning with small annual marches of several hundred organized initially by the Women's Suffrage Union in New York in 1908. These events grew in size and became colorful, elaborate, festive. They were effective, visible, and energizing. For example, the Women's Suffrage Parade of 1915 was held on October 23rd in New York City when 25,000 25, women marched up Fifth Avenue, all of them dressed in white with a blue sash across the bodice, the colors of the movement. The parade was led by women on horseback. 
Two years later, women began picketing the White House, then occupied by Woodrow Wilson. Organized by a more militant wing of the suffrage campaign led by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, who were in favor of more direct action than parades and marches inspired this movement and called it the National Woman's Party. Alice Paul, by the way, was highly educated with a PhD in sociology from the University of Pennsylvania. Among their many and inspired tactics, which I think a lot of us will appreciate today, these women had a huge oil drum placed near the White House with a fire burning inside it. And every time Woodrow Wilson made a speech talking about making the world safe for democracy while World War I raged, the women burned a copy of the speech. 33 women were arrested for picketing the White House and in one of the most shameful episodes in our history, brutalized, tortured, and force-fed in the Occoquan workhouse where they were incarcerated. Meanwhile, on the civil rights front, the NAACP organized dramatic marches also up Fifth Avenue in New York City to condemn the horrific violence being visited upon black communities. For example, the NAACP silent march against lynching was held on July 23, 1917. Men were in the lead and drummers kept up a steady cadence of both mourning and resolution. The men were followed by women and children. Nearly 10,000 participated in this march, which was urgently called after whites rioted in East St. Louis, killing and injuring scores of black residents and burning black homes and businesses. A year later, 1918, the NAACP organized another massive silent march up Fifth Avenue, this time to protest the savage lynching of a pregnant black woman whose name was Mary Turner in Georgia. Black women appealed to their white sisters in the suffrage movement to condemn lynching, doing their best to show the political dynamics and the connection between lynching and suffrage. They were not successful. However, black women's efforts did prevent the National American Woman Suffrage Association from allowing the suffrage amendment to be corrupted by the white women only strategy advocated by white women in some of the Southern associations. To that end, the struggle was always for universal women's suffrage. While the suffrage women worked for the federal amendment to the United States Constitution, they also conducted campaigns to win suffrage at the state level. Their annual parades were intended to keep suffrage front and center in tandem with these congressional and state legislative campaigns. The NAACP was firmly in support of women's suffrage and black men in northern and western states could vote. They were passionately urged to do so. Here's precisely why. The women's suffrage amendment, which had long since been introduced in the Congress, was stalled in committees, especially in the United States Senate, where the, they were controlled by southern whites who were rapidly racist. If this sounds at all reminiscent of some of the things going on today, don't be surprised. These senators from the South, the Deep South, they represented the remnants and descendants of the old slaveholding oligarchy. They were still trying to undo and nullify the 15th Amendment that had granted black men the right to vote. And insofar as possible, they wanted to suppress any notion of expanding suffrage rights, much less to women. W.E.B. Du Bois, editor of the NAACP's Crisis Magazine, and the preeminent architect of the modern civil rights, pan-African and black liberation movements <clears throat> issued a clarion call. He said, let every black man and woman, in he wrote in 1913, fight for the new democracy, which knows no race or sex. The black vote in favor of suffrage was a significant factor in winning women's suffrage in several Northern and Western elections, including California, 1911, Pennsylvania, 1915, New York, 1917. Tens of thousands of black women were to be found among the activists in the organized suffrage movement in the 20th century. Outstanding among them, here's a whole list of names, were Mary Church Terrell, Ida B. Wells, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, Margaret M. Washington, Ida R. Cummings, and Elizabeth L. Davis. In addition, the National Association of Colored Women, which was launched in 1896, 
with a uh, membership of 50,000 by 1914. And it ardently supported the suffrage cause. For the black women, the suffrage issue was always posed as a universal principle of citizenship. Now I'll start with some of the slides. Here we go. Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells was a black journalist from Memphis, Tennessee, who co-owned a newspaper called The Free Speech and Headlight. In 1892, she wrote a blazing editorial condemning the lynching of three young black men who were close personal friends. She called out the lies of a white-owned newspaper that was called The Commercial Appeal that said the men were lynched because they were planning, planning to rape a white woman. In fact, Thomas Moss, Kelvin McDowell, and Will Stewart owned the People's Grocery Store in Memphis that was doing very well and competing successfully against a white-owned grocery store. In her editorial, Wells condemned the oft-repeated oft excuse for lynching that falsely accused black men of sexual violence. Her editorial enraged powerful white men in the Memphis establishment. They burned her paper to the ground and warned that if she returned to Memphis, she would be lynched herself. As a result of this traumatic and firsthand experience with lynching, Ida B. Wells emerged as the chief architect of an international crusade against lynching. In her book called The Red Record, published in 1895, she recounted the lynching of black men in their struggle to exercise the franchise. She wrote with great passion. The government, which had made the Negro a citizen, found itself unable to protect him. It gave him the right to vote, but denied him the protection from which would have maintained that right. Scourged from his home, hunted through the swamp, hung by midnight riders, and openly murdered in the light of day. The Negro clung to his right of franchise with a heroism that would have wrung admiration from the hearts of savages. He believed that in the white small ballot there was a subtle something which stood for manhood as well as citizenship. And thousands of brave black men went to their graves exemplifying the one by dying for the other. <laughs> Mary Church Terrell. Mary Church Terrell was also from Memphis, came from one of the few black families with relative economic security. Encouraged by her father to pursue education, she obtained a master's degree from Oberlin College in 1888, and she was fluent in several languages, including Latin, French, and German. She was the first black woman to serve on a board of education anywhere in the United States, and was appointed to the Washington DC Board of Education in 1894. Terrell was a lifelong member of the National Woman Suffrage Association, and she was the founding president of that National Association of Colored Women that I mentioned before, and became Center for Black Women's Activism. <clears throat> this association provided economic relief in rural communities in the South, built schools, libraries, orphanages, and conducted annual educational campaigns for women's health and hygiene. Terrell was a frequent speaker at the women's suffrage conventions. Her first appearance was on February 18th, 1898 at the Columbia Theater in Washington. It was the 50th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention. Her speech was titled, the, Co the Progress of Colored Women. She began this way. She said 50 years ago, a meeting such as this planned and conducted and addressed by women would have been an impossibility. Less than 40 years ago, few sane men would have predicted that either a slave or one of his defendants would in this century at least address an audience in the nation's capital at the invitation of women representing the highest, broadest, best type of womanhood that can be found anywhere in the world. Thus, to me, the semi-centennial of the National American Women's Suffrage Association is a double jubilee, rejoicing as I do not only in the perspective and franchisement of my sex, but in the emancipation of my race. Terrell joined Ida B. Wells and thousands of other black women in a crusade against lynching and saw the ways in which lynching was used to terrorize black communities and to prevent any advancement for civil rights and property ownership and voting. Lynching was a savage affair. 
Hundreds, if not thousands of white people participated in the torture and killing of one or two individuals. Souvenirs in the form of body parts, pieces of rope and clothing were taken by members of the mob. Mary Church Terrell described lynching as, quote, the aftermath of slavery. It is impossible to comprehend the ferocity and barbarity which attend the average lynching bee without taking into account the brutalizing effect of slavery upon the white people of the South. Thousands of black men and women and some civil rights workers who were white and educators were lynched in the South beginning almost immediately after the Civil War had ended. Ida B. Wells, based on her experience and travels in the South and Midwest, placed the number of lynch victims at 10,000 before the turn of the 20th century. In spite of this racial terror and the efforts to suppress the woman's vote, the National American Women's Suffrage Association initiated an enormous national mobilization in 1917. With President Wilson finally signaling his support for the amendment and the great increase in the numbers of women working in industry during World War I, becoming more visible in public life, the suffrage amendment finally secured congressional adoption. The first in the House on January 10th, 1918, and in the Senate a year and a half later on June 4th, 1919. Now it required, if you recall, then you have to have three fourths of the states ratify constitutional amendment. So NASA, the association, redoubled its efforts for these state by state legislative battles. Carrie Chapman Katz was the chief architect of the state by state campaigns in which all male and all white legislatures had to be convinced to vote for women's suffrage. She had a huge black book. In it were inscribed the names of every member of every state legislature in the country and the names of their female relatives. Women suffragists in each of the states then visited the men's relatives and encouraged the women to pressure their fathers, husbands, sons, and brothers to approve votes for women. It was simply an extraordinary effort. In the final months of ratification, to see, in the final months of struggle to secure ratification, Frederick Douglass's words uttered 50 years before that women's suffrage, quote, depended upon the preliminary success of Negro suffrage, close quote, echoed with chilling accuracy. Those who sought to defeat woman suffrage determined to unite the Southern states in opposition. They required the endorsement of 13 states to stop the amendment. In the end, 10 states opposed ratification of woman suffrage. They were Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, Maryland, Louisiana, and Virginia symbolic of what the whole century had been about. The last battle for stratification was fought out in the former slaveholding state of Tennessee. After a bitter struggle in which the enfranchisement of black people was a pivotal issue, the Tennessee legislature voted its approval of the women's suffrage amendment on August 18, 1920 by one vote. The deciding vote was cast by Harry Burns, who reported that his mother, told him to vote for it, and that he, quote, always did what mother said, close quote. Carrie Chapman Catt summarized the meaning of their labors in the suffrage victory. It is doubtful if any man, even among suffrage men, ever realized what the suffrage struggle came to mean before the end was allowed in America. How much time and patience, how much work, energy and aspiration, how much faith, how much hope, how much despair went into it. It leaves its mark on all of such a struggle. It fills the days and rides the nights, working, eating, drinking, sleeping, it is there. Not all women in all the states of the union were in the struggle. There were some women in every state of the union who probably knew nothing about it. But most women in all the states were at at least its periphery and interest when they were not in the heart of it. To them, all its success became a monumental thing. But of course, this is not the end of the story because white supremacy, settler colonialism, and xenophobic laws prevented the extension of the franchise to millions of women and men in communities of color until the middle of the 20th century. For example, 
Native American women activists have been part of the association from its earliest days. Gertrude Simmons Bono was born on the Yankton Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. Her Lakota name was Zikala Sa, which means red bird. Bonin was a strong advocate and organizer for women's suffrage. Educated at a Quaker boarding school, she was later a graduate of Irwin College. After the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Bonin reminded the rejoicing newly enfranchised white women that the fight was not over. Native women could not vote. Indeed, Native American people did not become citizens of the United States until 1924. It was the Native women suffragists, Bonin among them, who organized and pressed for passage of the Snyder Act of 1924, which finally extended US citizenship to all Native people. <clears throat> but even with the passing of this citizenship bill, Native Americans were still prevented from participating in elections because the Constitution left it up to the states to decide who had the right to vote. Indigenous scholars noted that, quote, in response, many states enacted Jim Crow-like policies aimed at disenfranchising Indians. After the passage of the 1924 Citizenship Bill, it would take over 40 years for all 50 states to allow Native Americans to vote. In 1926, Bonin founded the National Council of American Indians, which identified land and resource issues facing Indian people. Throughout her lifetime, she served as a spokesperson for self-determination, the values of Indian culture, and Native sovereignty. Today, the struggle for Indigenous people's right to vote continues, with many progressive initiatives, including by a group called Four Directions which has registered thousands of Native Americans to vote, especially in Arizona, North and South Dakota, and Minnesota. Four Directions has battled the Trump administration's efforts to suppress that vote through legal maneuvers that so far have been successful. Mexican-American women in the Southwest and California were also prominent suffrage leaders. Among them, for example, was Jovita Idar, She was born in Laredo, Texas, and grew up in a large family. Her father and brothers published a newspaper, La Cronica, that advocated strongly for an end to the racist discrimination against Mexican people, the segregation of the public schools, and the lynching of Mexican men. Texas Rangers and Texas authorities tried to suppress the paper, and in one memorable incident, Jovita Idar stood up to them, refusing to allow them to enter the building and citing her First Amendment rights. The Rangers returned later, however, when she was gone and smashed the printing presses. It was common in Texas to see signs that said, no Negroes, Mexicans, or dogs allowed, well into the 1960s. Idar was fortunate in that her family situation encouraged her to receive a good education, which she did through the Methodist Church. And she began her adult life as a teacher in the town of Los Cuelos, in Southeast Texas. Appalled by the conditions in these segregated schools, she decided that working as a journalist and taking a more public role would be more effective in the struggles of the Mexican American people for basic rights. Her civil rights work soon embraced the call for women's suffrage, especially after 1911, when women in California won the right to vote. According to an article in the New York Times, Idar frequently took pen names among them, Astrea, the name of the Greek goddess of justice, and Ave Negra, Spanish for black bird, and wrote about equal rights for women. She regularly urged women to educate themselves and seek independence from men. She defined the modern woman as someone with, quote, broad horizons. She went on, quote, science, industry, the workshop, and even the home demand her best aptitudes, her perseverance and consistency in work and her influence and assistance for all that is progress and advancement for humanity. However, despite these efforts throughout the Southwest and in Texas to allow for Mexican-American women and men to vote, state laws, outright terror, segregation, poverty, conspired to prevent the vast majority of them from doing so until passage of the 1965 Civil Rights Act. This right to vote, however, remains an ongoing struggle today. 
as ice raids and sweeps spread great fear in Latinx communities where thousands are racially profiled, their homes raided, workplaces invaded, and many detained even when they are U.S. citizens. Chinese American women were also active in the women's suffrage movement, even as xenophobic and racist discrimination percolated through society. Among them was Maple Pinghua Lee. She was the first Chinese woman in the United States to earn her doctorate in the United States. It was from Columbia University in politics and economics in 1921. She was a strong advocate for the rights of women and the civil rights of Chinese communities in America. Thousands of Chinese men had immigrated to the United States in the mid 19th century to work on the railroads and in the mines. To end this immigration and to prevent Chinese men from marrying and establishing permanent communities, Congress passed two laws. The first, known as the Page Act in 1875, prohibited, quote, prostitutes, unquote, from entering the United States, a thinly veiled Chinese Exclusion Act to prevent Chinese women from immigrating. Many Chinese women were brought to the United States by white sex traffickers and held in virtual slavery, but this law did nothing to inhibit that trade. Then in 1882, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act that dramatically shrank the number of Chinese immigrants, men and women, admitted into the United States and denied Chinese people the right to become naturalized citizens. This made the Chinese the only people in the world who were ineligible to become US citizens. This law was review, renewed every 10 years and extended to immigrants from other Asian countries, including the Philippines and Japan. Despite these laws, Mabel Pinghua Lee came to the United States from Canton, now Guangzhou, China, around 1900, when she was roughly five years old. Her family lived in New York City, where her father served as the Baptist minister of the Morningside Mission in Chinatown. <clears throat> her parents were able to immigrate under the, one of the very few exceptions to the Chinese Exclusion Act because they were teachers working for the Baptist this church. In 1911, a revolution in China led by Sun Yat-sen overthrew the imperial order and established a Chinese republic. Among the many reforms and new laws of this republic, a great number of Chinese women won the right to vote. As news of the Chinese revolution reached the United States, white suffrage le leaders celebrated. They wanted to know more. They turned to local Chinese communities to teach them. According to Kathleen Hill, writing for the official U.S. Centennial Committee, leading, quoting, leading Chinese women from cities like Portland, Oregon, Cincinnati, Boston, and New York were invited to speak at white suffrage meetings in the spring of 1912. Eager for an audience, Chinese women seized the opportunity to share the news of women's contribution to the founding of their new nation. They told of the women's brigades that fought side by side with men in the revolution and provided for women's suffrage. At the same time, they appealed to the white women in the audience to help address the needs of Chinese communities in the United States, especially the demeaning immigration laws that they faced, close quote. Among those speakers was a then 16-year-old Mabel Pinghua Lee, finishing her high school studies and very soon to enter Barnard College. And that's the picture on the slide that you see, just about her age um, and a rather, a rather sexist uh, underpinning from the newspaper that says Chinese girl uh, rather than woman. She reminded her audience that Chinese women in the United States suffered under the burden of not only sexism, but also racial prejudice. She especially urged more equitable educational opportunities for Chinese girls and boys in New York City. So impressed with her were the New York suffrage leaders that they invited her to ride in the honor guard that would lead the 1912 suffrage march up Fifth Avenue. From this moment on, Mabel Lee's activist career was launched. Mabel Ping Hua Lee eventually took over the First Baptist Church in New York that her father had ministered in Chinatown. She became a leading figure in New York Chinatown community, advocated always for women's rights and the rights of Chinese people, but sexist and racist discrimination prevented her from ever securing an academic position commensurate with her education. 
Chinese people gained the right to US citizenship in 1943 when Congress ended the 1924 Exclusion Act and allowed for Chinese people to become naturalized citizens. Once attaining citizenship, Chinese women and men could register to vote. In 1965, that's a long time later, 65, the last remnants of the exclusion policies that had established a quota system limiting immigration to the United States to 105 Chinese people per year was finally ended and this allowed for the reunification of thousands of Chinese families. Now I wish to return to the struggle for black voting rights that followed the woman suffrage victory. With the victory of women's suffrage in 1920, black women in the South went by the thousands to register to vote. They were not even admitted into the courthouse. Just as black men had been so brutally disenfranchised for generations, so black women were also prevented from voting by whatever means necessary. Women's suffrage was a momentous victory, but it was another 45 years before black suffrage was won in the South with passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Fannie Lou Hamer was a sharecropper from Louisville, Mississippi. When she and other black women tried to register to vote in 1963, they were thrown off their land. Then she and others were arrested. In jail, she was brutally beaten. She suffered severe internal injuries and was hospitalized for a considerable time. Once back on her feet, she returned her, to her voting rights work and became a field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Folks said Fannie Lou Hamer was fearless. With black folks unable to vote, the Democratic Party primary elections in Mississippi and elsewhere in the South were always all white and had been for generations. Mrs. Hamer and SNCC determined to change that. In 1964, a presidential election year, they organized what they called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Mrs. Hamer was its driving force and main strategist. Thousands of Mississippians, black and some white folks, registered in the Freedom Party and voted in their own primary. They elected delegates to the National Democratic Party Convention that was being held in August, 1964. They challenged the all white Mississippi delegation. The freedom delegates were led by Mrs. Hamer. The Democratic Party's Convention Rules Committee, however, refused to allow the freedom Democrats to be seated and they were not permitted on the convention floor. However, a member of the New York delegation gave up their seat to allow Mrs. Hamer to testify before the Credentials Committee. Mrs. Hamer gave a powerful speech on the meaning of democracy, broadcast on national television. She told her story of trying to register to vote and the details of the terrible beating she had sustained. Then she said, all of this on account of we want to register to become first class citizens and if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America? The land of the free and the home of the brave. And we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America. Mrs. Hamer was not seated, nor were the Freedom Democrats credentialed, nor were they allowed to vote, but her speech galvanized the country. And in its aftermath, the Democratic Party was very soon to be transformed. The 1965 Voting Rights Act, with its strict provisions for federal jurisdiction in determining the voting protocols and laws in those states, with a history of racial violence and black disenfranchisement, finally succeeded in establishing voting rights for black women and men in the South. That's how black women won suffrage. A century after the end of slavery, and 45 years after the victory of women's suffrage. By way of conclusion, in June 2013, the United States Supreme Court in a five to four decision gutted the enforcement section of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. This section of the law had required the states with historic and systemic racial discrimination in voting to obtain approval of the US Department of Justice for any changes they proposed to make in their voting laws. 
Writing for the majority in the 2013 decision, Chief Justice John Roberts observed that the law had been effective and that barriers to black suffrage had been overcome. And therefore, this enforcement provision was no longer needed. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, in her most forceful dissent, observed that by this logic, one might close up an umbrella in a rainstorm because it was effective in keeping you dry. As soon as the Supreme Court invalidated that section of the Voting Rights Act, states where Republicans were in power rushed to reestablish barriers to voting that particularly affected communities of color, especially Black and Latinx communities. They did this by introducing strict ID laws, limiting the time one had to register to vote, invalidating voting, voter, invalidating registrations because of some minor difference in signature, for example, the, the placement of a middle initial, and ending or limiting early voting. Early voting mattered, in particular because the Black communities in the South, there is a tradition of whole congregations going to vote on Sundays immediately following church services. Even as early voting has already begun for the 2020 presidential election, and according to the figures I saw this morning, 46 million people in the United States have already voted. Many uh, court cases about the election rules are still pending. For example, in North Carolina and Pennsylvania. All of this while a pandemic continues to sicken thousands of people and voting by mail introduced in many states to counter the necessity for in-person voting has been compromised by the president's executive actions to severely limit the funding of the United States Postal Service. Finally, voting rights are denied for life for those convicted of felonies in many, many states. This is then deeply intertwined with the long history of racism in the criminal justice system and the mass incarceration of hundreds of thousands of Black, Latinx, and Native American men and women. Efforts to change this, for example, in Florida, where voters in 2018 voted to lift this ban have been thwarted by Republican control legislatures. One of the current movements to build new strategies for voter participation is being led by Stacey Abrams. Abrams, a graduate of Yale Law School and a former member of the Georgia State Legislature, ran for the governor of Georgia in 2018. She would have been the first black woman ever elected governor in any state. She lost her bid in a highly contested election by only 55,000 votes. Abrams initiated a new organization called Fair Fight, and through it, they have registered tens of thousands of new voters in Georgia and elsewhere in the South. Abrams, Stacey Abrams carries forward the historic traditions of Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell and so many other thousands of women. It is with this kind of historical perspective and the long, long struggle for universal suffrage that we can see more clearly into today's political landscape. The battle for women's suffrage was partially won 100 years ago in an epic struggle. And the dream of universal suffrage has yet to be realized. Yet I am hopeful and inspired by the women who sacrificed so much for so long and by the a work of women like Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who did so much to advance the cause of women's equality and equal protection of the laws for women in the second half of the 20th century. Even as we mourn her death, we all rise. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm really, I just want to say, I'm really looking forward to the Q&A and um, any questions that people have, I do my best to respond to them. Thank you, Dr. Aptiker, for that fascinating presentation. And now we would like to take some time to answer any questions you may have, just as a reminder to Post your question, click the Q&A button you'll see at the bottom of your screen. The Q&A will be moderated by Kate Steffens. She is our special collections librarian for the King Library. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, um, and we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. 
although we may not have enough time. We're going to give it a shot. Okay, Kate, I will hand it over to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, you can just type them into the Q&A there, and I will send them over to Dr. Aptiker. Um, since we don't have any other questions coming in, I'll just get the ball rolling with one of my own questions. Um, have your views on suffrage and suffragists changed over the years? Um, when I was growing up, we were taught suffrage from a very um, white women's suffragist point of view. And some of those women, their legacies are being scrutinized these days. And I was just curious if, if your mind has changed you know, on women like Susan B. Anthony and people like that. So I grew up in a quite radical family. <laughs> some people know about my background and was very familiar with um, African-American people and African-American history for much of my life uh, and was introduced really into the uh, history of women as I studied black women's history. That was my entrance here. I studied black women's history first and then I really got involved in, in studying sort of the broader uh, women's movements. And um, as, a, as a result of this, um, in my early studies and so forth, I saw the racism that was operating uh, among white women, which I tried to show in my talk uh, today as well. Uh, and uh, certainly Susan B. Anthony, so, so I'll just say this, no, my thinking has not changed because it was always, <laughs> it was always critical. But I think for many people, it's been important to reassess the role that, um, white women were playing and what they were doing. But I, you will notice in my talk today, I also wanted to point out, you see, that white men were also racist. In other words, white supremacy was built into the fabric of society. And that's why people like Douglas and other leaders in the black movement formed their own organizations and their own newspapers. And, and they participated with white people in coalition, but they also, worked in a, in a broader, uh, in, in, a, in very direct ways in terms of the black community and the black voice. And that's always been true. I think what people are referring to specifically with both Anthony and Stanton, and see both were in the abolitionist movement. And so both had, had, had done a great deal in the anti-slavery movement. It wasn't like they were unfamiliar with it or didn't care about it, uh, on the contrary. But when the, 15th, when the 14th and 15th Amendments were introduced into Congress, they specifically introduced the word male into the US Constitution in connection with voting rights that had not existed before. There's no mention of voting rights in the US Constitution. That's another thing that people don't usually know. There's no mention of it. So when they introduced the word male, Anthony and Stanton and other people, and not all of them white, Sojourner Truth also objected to it because it excluded, it by definition, then that those amendments would exclude women from ever being able to vote. That was what they were worried about. What diff so in any event, the 15th, you know, then the, the question was who was going to support the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote. And at that, at that juncture, Anthony and Stanton and other women voted against supporting the 15th Amendment and others in the uh, voted for it, you know, to, to maintain and struggle for it and so forth. So what happened then was that the suffrage movement split apart. And I, I always, this again did not change, my, I knew this, but it split apart and there were two associations. What's most, most unfortunate about Anthony and Stanton is that they campaigned against the 15th Amendment. And they aligned themselves with a particularly racist man named George Train in Kansas, where, the, where it was on the ballot. Women's suffrage and black suffrage was on the ballot in Kansas in the late 19th century. And because they aligned themselves with Train, they really said and did awful racist things. And that is just, that's the historical record. Um, and that's just the truth of it. But you also have to look at their before and then after, in particular, Anthony um, had um, close relationships with black women, including particularly Ida B. Wells. Uh, 
whom she welcomed into her home and so forth. So you see, it's not just the, it's, it's complicated. Um, and it's, I'm not trying to excuse in any way the racism, I'm just trying to say it's complicated. And the men were, as, the white men were as much implicated as the white women. But I will say that sexism has led to a much greater con condemnation of the women than of the men. I'd like to see some condemnation that, you know, at least analysis, you know what I'm saying? Analysis of um, uh, the white men as well. So that that's perhaps a, a way of responding to that question. I think it's very healthy that we're all looking at this history and all re-examining it and all understanding it from a more uh, a, a, a sensitivity and understanding of white supremacy. Uh, we've got some great questions coming in. So first we've got, what factors that prevent, prevented women's rights back then do you think are continuing today? Well, <laughs> I think I call it misogyny. It's a form of male supremacy. It's very deep in our culture, just as white supremacy is very deep in the culture. So there's all kinds of uh, prejudices and so forth. Um, against women, white and black. It, it just, they take different configurations because the way race, <coughs> racism will enter into it. So for example, Kamala, Kamala Harris, Harris, excuse me, Kamala Harris is facing particular kinds of attacks as both as, as, a, as a woman, but also as a black and South Asian woman, you know, um, <coughs> that a white person wouldn't. And also that a black may, male would not you see what I'm saying? Because it's because it's intertwined with the sexism. Um, I think, you know, um, Hillary Clinton likewise took. I mean, there's all these comments about uh, how the, how people are dressed and what they say, and there's such a double standard in terms of the women are represented and how they're seen. They have less authority. Uh, any kind of speech, especially a speech that's affirming or forceful, is seen as aggressive. Whereas in a man, it's seen as strength. Now, th th there's so many stereotypes like that that you know one could name that uh, really um, impact uh, the way in which uh, people perceive uh, and and the way therefore in which um, sexism persists uh, in the culture. And um, th th there's all kinds of ways in which one could see it in terms of sexual violence against women, uh, especially black women. Uh, suffer a great, greatly disproportionate amount of sexual violence. So do Native American women. Um, so there's a way, you see what I'm trying to say, we call it intertwining or intersection in which race and gender and class and sexuality all get tied up together and they affect the way women are treated today and seen and perceived and understood. Thank you. Uh, next question is, with the hollowing out of the Voting Rights Act, what does the future look like? <laughs> well, I, I try to be optimistic. <laughs> so there's a huge, you know, this is an excellent question. And, and hollowing out is a very good way of expressing what happened to the uh, Voting Rights Act. Now, the first thing is that in the House of Representatives, a new Voting Rights Act has been um, uh, submitted <clears throat> that um, tries to reestablish the uh, import the the sanctions if voting rights are denied in different states, but through Congress again, and it's called the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Uh, and of course, it hasn't gone anywhere, uh, and I don't know that it will go anywhere until after this election. I have not seen the whole text of it, but I know that that's been introduced. Um, this, this, the other thing about this is that it's all being fought out. This question of voting rights is being fought out now as the uh, presidential election is proceeding. So we see it in lawsuits that are pending in all these different states. For example, um, a good example, one, one example of it is when you, when you ask for an absentee ballot or you ask you know, to, to have a vote by mail, does it, if it's postmarked by November 3rd, the date of the election, is it acceptable if it arrives after November 3rd? Some states allow it and other states don't. 
And so there have been lawsuits to try to get it extended, especially because there's been so many budget cuts to the Postal Service. So in general, one can say you can look at the electoral field and all these different lawsuits that are pending about ID laws, for example, that particularly affect um, um, people of color or poor people. Um, another example of this is thousands of Native Americans were registered to vote uh, in, in Minnesota by this group four directions that I mentioned before. And um, the, registra the, the registrars are refusing to process their registrations, but they are processing the registration of non-Native voters. So four directions has had to file a lawsuit. <laughs> And we're two weeks out from the election. You know, you see, you see what I'm saying? So that it's an ongoing struggle. And, um, and you know, I think the, the current occupant of the White House said it very honestly in one moment when he said, if all these people could vote, we will never win an election again. And that's because the demographic, that's what this is about. What this is about is that the demographics of the country are changing. And there's a much larger uh, people of color in the, in the population and, and, and uh, Black Lives Matter has had an enormous impact. Other movements, the Me Too movement had an enormous impact. And so there's very profound demographic and cultural changes that are taking place. Also the gay, the gay liberation movement, you know. And, 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 and so these are very profound things that are changing the culture and that's the struggle that's going on. And it manifests right now in terms of voting rights. Thank you. Uh, next question is, what can we do, what can we each do as individuals to continue fighting for just voting rights today? Well, the first most obvious thing is to register and vote. <laughs> vote, vote, vote. Um, I think the other thing we can do is um, in many states right now, there's, um, there's a number of different um, initiatives that are being undertaken. One is for um, uh, getting the vote out, so helping people to be able to get to the polls, like they, and there's groups that are doing this. You could go online. I don't have the information in front of me, but uh, for example, driving people so that they can go to the poll. You know, in I'll give you an example. Let me let me backtrack and make it clear. In the state of Texas, the Republican governor has set up only one voting um, box. In other words, if you had an absentee ballot or were voting by mail and you didn't want to mail it, you wanted to go to a, a, a voting box, a ballot box, um, he, set up, he set it up so there's only one box in every county, one box per county. But you see, Texas is vast. Texas is a huge state and one county can be huge. People don't necessarily have cars or they don't necessarily can't take a day off of work to go and, and so there's an effort to uh, help people drive them, to drive people to these, and also drive people to the polling places if they want to vote uh, early or on the election day. I think the other thing that's happening is uh, poll watchers. Um, and I'm not talking about all this um, um, aggressive stuff that's being done, but where you're, you're just, you're, poll watchers is an, a long established tradition in our democracy and the people go and just um, make sure that you're abiding by what the laws are in the state. For example, that you can't campaign with 100, within 100 feet of a, vote, of a polling place or that you can't intimidate voters and, and so on. So the, the poll watches like that, which I think is very, very helpful. But I think getting out the vote is the most important thing. And I know that there are still people texting <clears throat> potential voters different states urging them to please vote. So I think that's those kinds of things are the most important thing we can do. Thank you. Um, so this is a question about your thoughts on the almost certain appointment of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. Well, this is dreadful. <laughs> it's very difficult. Um, her views, as far as I can understand them, uh, insofar as we have access to things that she's written, things that she said, what the reports have been, her views are actually far, far to the right of even conservative people in the United States. She, she's way over there 
um, in terms of her ideas. Now, <clears throat> you can never say, you know, for certain how much something will influence a person on the court, but that is certainly why she was selected and certainly why the Republicans are hell-bent to seat her before November 3rd. Now, part of the, under, so I think it'd be dreadful. I think it, it, it's not just that she's conservative, it's the way in which she's conservative. And, um, and, and it's not her Catholic uh, religious affiliation, but the affiliations that she's had with quite a, extreme um, evangelical kinds of group uh, that really shaped a lot of her thinking. It's not even that she clerked for uh, Scalia because, okay, you know, he was a conservative justice and, and so forth. But there's something about her thinking that is very, very worrisome on all the issues and, and also on race, just everything. Even though I did note, and I think it's important to note that she's an interracial family. She adopted two children from Haiti. So <clears throat> um, what I, what I, that, it's a coup. It's a kind of coup uh, that they're trying to pull off. I also think the urgency about it is they know they're going down on November 3rd. All of the polls are showing that they're going to lose the elections. And even in red states, it looks like they're very close. I mean, Lindsey Graham is fighting for his life in South Carolina, South Carolina right now. Um, and McC um, McConnell is also fighting very, very hard in his state. And so this is suggesting that uh, the electorate is very clear. I think that's why there's 46 million people that have already voted. Um, so, um, but I, I see her, it, it's, it's a real setback. And, and how we're going to deal with it, I don't know. I mean, we'll see what unfolds. But I also want to point out that sometimes people, you think they're going to be one way, and then, like that Gorsuch, for example, uh, surprised people with his recent vote relating to gay rights. I mean, you, you don't always know for sure about how somebody's going to be on the court. Um, but uh, we know the motivation. That is, we know the motivation of the Republicans right now and their real fury to get her onto the court before November 3rd, which is just ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> and... And of course, the hypocrisy of it, but I think it. I think it's very terrible. I think it's. I think it bodes very ill for the court. I also want to say that, quite apart from that, I just want to express enormous grief over the death of Justice Ginsburg, who gave her everything. She gave everything to hang in there, and um, she was a marvelous model, a marvelous person. And a marvelous justice. Agreed. Thank you. Um, this is a two-parter from one of our fellow librarians. Um, what can be done to help black female ex-felons be able to vote in places where they have to pay past debts or the Native American women who live on reservations in places that don't have traditional addresses where Republicans have used the strategy of disallowing voters to vote who don't have street addresses? So, uh, excellent questions. And with regard to the first one uh, with black, um, I think she, she said women ex-felons, right? She was black female ex-felons, yeah. Yeah, um, to, so, what happened in Florida, which is a good case to perhaps um, start with, is um, the, the I, think, I think the person who asked this question knows this already. In Florida in 2018, there was a proposition on the ballot that would have allowed uh, people who were felons to be able to uh, vote, to do away with the prohibition against them voting. And, the, and it was, that proposition was passed by something like a, a very overwhelming majority, so I think it was 60 percent, who said that should happen. And then the Republican-controlled legislature, what they did was they said, oh, well, <laughs> they'll be able to vote if they pay all the court costs and their fines and so on and so forth. So what happened in Florida in this regard, which is both women, women and men, it's not, it's not only uh, men, it's also women who are felons, what, what happened with that was that um, Blumberg, 
Mike Blumberg started to take the initiative on this, and they, they started a fund to raise millions of dollars to pay the fines. And uh, my understanding is they've raised something like $16 million, and they've started to pay the fines. And that, uh, so that it's something like 32,000 people can now register to vote. My figures may be off, but that's what I saw in the, mostly the Washington Post. So that, that's one strategy that can be used. The other strategy that can be used, but it won't be effective for this election, is to change the state laws, uh, to change the, the state legislative laws around this. So that, And, and that's why my, my point was about the um, uh, kind of restrictions that happen at the state, because the voting rights are established. There can be a federal jurisdiction, but they're, they're basically set by the states. That's how the Constitution sets it up. So we have to go state by state and get this changed so that people who have been convicted of felonies will be able to vote. And that I, I think that can be successful. Um, the, the other with regard to Native American people and Native American women in particular is uh, I think that's what Four Directions and other groups are trying that I mentioned in my talk are trying to deal with is um, how to guarantee. So this, this business of having to have street addresses um, and post office boxes are no good. You're supposed to have a street address. But then people who live on reservations, so let me first say, Native American people who live in cities, in urban areas, they have street addresses. But Native American people that live on reservations, especially reservations, say like the Diné Nation, the Navajo people, they don't necessarily have street addresses because uh, it's a vast area and they're not set up that way. So I think there are suits that the four directions have filed to try to change that. Again, that may have to be a state-by-state -state fight, you see. So I don't think that's going to happen in time for the 2020 election. But these are excellent questions, and these are the things we have to watch out for and the things we need to correct. Thank you. Um, this is a great question. Who are leaders today, both women and men, who give you hope for continued advocacy for voting rights for all? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, first of all, I'd say Stacey Abrams, whom I already mentioned in my talk. I think she's, she's done fantastic. Uh, she's been fantastic in her efforts. And it's not just limited to Georgia or the South, although she concentrated a lot of her voter registration work there. But she gives me great hope uh, for this. But I'll tell you where a lot of my hope lies. A lot of my hope lies in the women and men in the Black Lives Matter movement. They have been fantastic. They have been phenomenal in their coming out and uh, and most of those protests, by the way, have been com completely peaceful and um, very disciplined. And they've even had masks on to protect from COVID-19 and done all si so sorts of things. And that gives me great hope in terms of the uh, younger generation. And that movement at, at its height after George Floyd, after Mr. Floyd was murdered, and um, <clears throat> as some people said after he was lynched, right on, right in, right on our video screens. Um, it gives me great hope because that movement had the feel to me of what it felt like in the 60s. It was the first time I felt a certain kind of mass upsurge that felt very similar to what I experienced personally in the 60s. And it was, it was, it was tremendous. And, and a lot of the people that came out around the Black Lives Matter were white people. A lot of the protests included many, many white people who weren't all black by any means. And I think that's very important. So I'm very hopeful about that because that kind of movement changes the political landscape. That's why I said in terms of voting rights for all, um, it changes the political landscape. And the other is um, um, my hope of people like, um, his name is Jamie Harrison who's running and uh, Ralph Warnock who's running uh, for office and of course K Kamala Harris and, and uh, Biden and so forth. Those people will, uh, I, they give me hope, but the, the, Southern, the, Southern, the Southern struggle gives me particular hope because that's always a bellwether. It's always a bellwether in the South. Uh, that's why I think Stacey Abrams has been so important. So that's, 
got some of the people um, that I find very, very inspiring right now. Um, and then, you know, there's all the, the movie, you know, there's all the celebrity uh, stuff going on too with uh, supporting Black Lives Matter and supporting cultural institutions and doing all kinds of things like that. But it's the young people that give me the, the strongest impulse, you know. And by young, look, I'm 76, so you know, <laughs> but I have a very expansive de definition of what's young. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so this questioner says, I always thought women's suffrage was only helping women to get the right to vote, but it seems it was also helping them have equal rights such as education and domestic violence bans. When were the laws changed when women no longer were property of their husband and when was it illegal for men to beat their wife? Wonderful question. <laughs> so these things again, wonderful question. And, and these things again show you how intertwined everything is. So <clears throat> with, the, with regard to property rights, um, it was a gradual, what the question is saying, you know, were women the property of men? It was a gradual way in which those laws changed, and they changed in the states. And I have to, you have to again give credit to Susan B. Anthony in particular, and um, and Stanton, who after the after after the Fifteenth Amendment struggle was over, were in New York, and uh, published a newspaper called The Revolution. And in that newspaper, and in their advocacy, and in their writing. Uh, among many other women, but they particularly uh, campaigned for changes in the divorce laws. And they were successful. So the divorce laws began to change by the late 19th century. And as you see, because the divorce was that the woman was the property of the husband and lost custody of her children and so forth. So that you see that, that the divorce thing was like a hub. Those laws were kind of like a hub of that. So as those property laws changed, um, and as the divorce laws changed, that was very important. That was one place where it was really, really helpful and really important. Um, <clears throat> the, um, in terms of domestic violence, I'll just share this historical story. I think I have time, yeah. Do I have time? Well, um, we don't really get rid of domestic, well, <laughs> we are not rid of it yet, but the <clears throat> domestic violence was at first accepted as being something that uh, a, a, a man could chastise his wife. That was the idea of it. Um, and it begins to change again, late 19th century, but it doesn't really, really, really change until the women's liberation movement because nobody talked about it. There's nothing in the public discourse about domestic violence. And it starts to change in the, in the late 60s and 70s as the women's liberation movement begins to uh, launch itself. And it becomes a major issue, as does rape. And before that, again, there's no discussion of it in the public discourse. You don't have discussion. It's not that it didn't happen. Of course it happened. Um, but, it, but it's not. Um, and just as a sidebar to this, rape laws were originally property laws, not assault laws. Rape was where one man violated the property rights of another man by sexually raping his daughter or wife. So they were, they were considered assaults. You see, they, were, they were considered property rights. So that gradual, that's why everything turned on the behavior of the woman. That's why with domestic violence also, it was all about the woman did something that provoked and um, early domestic violence cases came before family courts where women were usually advised in family courts to, to go back to their husbands and behave properly as women. So this is part of what, it's part of the uh, subjugation of women. It's part of the structure. So uh, in the late 60s and 70s, the laws began to change around domestic violence. And because um, that was the main question. And the last laws, 1993, 1993, all of the states finally had on their books that husbands could rape their wives. Up until that time, 
Although the laws were very ambivalent about that, and they didn't allow for any kind of prosecution or anything. And rape is also connect, is often connected to domestic violence. That's why I'm making the link there. So this is this is remains an ongoing issue, and we see many hundreds of women, maybe thousands of women, in prison today for killing their abuser. But that was never was is very rarely permitted as a defense. Um, talking about domestic violence. So um, one last thing about this is very complicated because in communities of color, you don't necessarily want an abuser to be arrested because of the racists of the criminal justice system. So there's other organizations that have sprung up in the black community, for example, uh, like transformative justice or restorative justice that are movements trying to find an alternative to the criminal justice system while also protecting uh, women and children and the right and men and their rights um, in communities. So that's kind of what I can do with that question in a short period of time. Thank you. So we've only got a couple more minutes left. I'll see how many of these are we can get through. Um, next question is, what were the most successful tactics and techniques that women use to get the attention of authorities? Also, would you say these techniques would work in today's society? <laughs> well, <clears throat> anytime, this, okay, these questions are great. I thank, the, I thank all of you, you know, for these, these questions. Um, <clears throat> whenever women come together in large numbers, they grab attention. So uh, the women's marches today, very effective, very effective. But the same with the suffrage marches back in the turn of the century, in the early 20th century, because it was so, at that time, so unusual to see thousands and thousands and thousands of women in lines of march because they didn't have that kind of public life. And then today, when you see the women's march, there are men that are part of it, of course, but it's organized by women and it, it, it has had, it has, it has tremendous impact, um, those, those kinds of tactics. I think um, any kind of women speaking in public, women as journalists, women as um, lawyers, women as judges. Um, I thought the tactic that Alice Paul used that I talked about of burning the speeches at the White House was a very, you know, is very effective. It really annoyed the heck out of uh, <laughs> then President Wilson. So, uh, you know, coming up with creative kinds of tactics like that um, and signs. And so I remember the first women's march I was on in 20, what was it, 2017, right after he was elected. And the signs were wonderful. And it was such joyous. It was like a wonderful expression of things. And, and millions and millions of people participated in that. So, um, but effectiveness is also last thought, it's not just one tactic, it's com combined tactics. That includes voting, includes voter registration, includes um, community meetings, organizing on a local level. It's like everything uh, that's, that pulls together. It's not like one or two uh, things that are better than others. It all has to come together. Great, thank you. Um, this is a good one for this day and age. How do we combat polarization in this country and regenerate empathy? Right. So this is, this is the question right now is about the polarization. And this uh, uh, White House occupant uh, has done so much to aggravate this and force this kind of polarization. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I think it's really important for all of us in our daily lives in every way we possibly can to manifest as much empathy and compassion for everybody that we meet, no matter who we encounter, to not yell at them, to exude warmth toward them. They're just human beings. Just, that's, that's just number one for all of us in terms of our own behavior every day. We can do this ourselves. Um, and I think that's very important because that in itself is a counter. 
even if you can't stand what somebody's saying, okay, okay, but they're a human being. And, you know, when I, when I was teaching, one of the things I experienced was sometimes students would get very angry at something I would say. And one of the things I learned to do was walk into the anger and ask them why they were angry. What had happened? What did I say that upset them? And I often found that there was some kind of experience that they had that had upset them tremendously. And maybe in our conversation, if I'm talking to them with some warmth and compassion, they could maybe reframe the way they were thinking about what happened. Um, but that, so I think the biggest thing is in terms of this kind of our behavior. And if, if hundreds of thousands of us, and there are hundreds of thousands of us who are decent, you know, who are by decent, I just mean who are not part of this uh, fascistic kind of movement, if we could exhibit this kind of listening, compassion, empathy, I think that would help a great deal. I don't think there's any magic bullet for this, pardon the expression of magic bullet, but I don't think there's any kind of magic for this. I think it has to do with changing the whole, uh, the whole culture. Thank you. Um, we've reached the end, but um, we would be happy to invite you to answer more questions depending on how you feel. Sure, I'll take a few more if you're able to keep it open. And yeah. You know, I'll, 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 why don't we go another 10 minutes? How's that? Okay. Is, Sounds is that great. Okay. Perfect. Um, this it's, is one. Oh, go ahead. Wonderful. It's like there's so much engagement. It's great. Um, Oh, this is a great question. Why did the founders leave voting rights to the states? Doesn't this present problems for a national law regarding voting rights? <laughs> oh, good question. Okay, look, the founders of this country <laughs> were all, uh, not all, many of the founders, first of all, many of the founders of this country were slaveholders. So we need to understand how central that was to the establishment of the country. And once we get that understanding, once we get to that piece of understanding about, about it, everything in the Constitution, so much, not everything, but so much in the Constitution are compromises. They're all about compromises because they're trying to establish the Republic, to, to establish our our nation, but at the same time, they have to accommodate uh, the pressures. So for example, written into the Constitution is that black men or black people are three fifths of a person. That's written into the Constitution. That was so the Southern states could count black people as part of how many of their population for purposes of representation in the House. That's crazy, you know. I mean, from a certain point of view, but that's an accommodation for slaveholding, to the slaveholding. So, so much in the Constitution is built this way. Um, and that's the first thing I think to understand about it. The protection of property rights, the, um, uh, and in terms of giving the rights you see to the states was to compromise in terms of voting rights. It's not, there's no voting rights in the Constitution. There's no mention of voting in the Constitution. No mention at all. But everything was a compromise about states' rights and federal rights. It's a back and forth like that. With uh, the slaveholding class wanting as much to be state right because they had the power, they had more power there. So <clears throat> I think this is part of the dynamic of our whole history. It's, it's part of the dynamic of the whole history of our country. Um, and it's the same thing with the establishment of the Electoral College. You know, how that gets established and why that was established. So these are all, um, it, you know, the compromises that were made, most of which centered around the issue of slavery. And this is the, this is the big, you know, this is the heart of white supremacy. This is the heart of the problem that we have in this country. It's never been addressed, never been resolved. And I think there's some people uh, in the Southern well, not just in the South. I think there are some white people who think the Civil War uh, was, has never ended. And, and that's why you can, so you can see it's still going on. Um, so that, that's how I would, I would address this issue of, of these 
uh, kinds of compromises that were made. And, you know, in the original Constitution, for example, there's no mention of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is a separate document. It's the first 10 amendments. That's not in the original, because these were relatively conservative men also. Some of the, there's only a couple that you might say were really revolutionaries in the sense of their thinking. I think of Ben Franklin. I think he was quite revolutionary in his thinking. Um, he was also anti-slavery. He founded the first anti-slavery society in the United States. So he's a little more revolutionary. I think John Adams was a little more revolutionary. But if you looked at George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, they're all slaveholders. They're all slaveholders. So, and so on. I mean, you can just keep going with it. So I, I just think that that's, um, that, that might be a response to the question. And, um, and that, one last thought about that. There are some very conservative Republicans who think that the United States is not a democracy, it's a republic. You see that in the rhetoric right now. And it harks back to this time. It harks back to a sort of originalist um, reading of the Constitution of the United States. Thank you. Um, this question says, we have seen women leaders in New Zealand, Israel, UK, Germany, the Philippines, India, and many other countries. What are your thoughts about the higher barriers and discrimination about women in political leadership? It's very interesting, isn't it? Uh, in terms of just looking at the world, um, how we have been uh, so much, so much behind so much of the world in this country um, in rep women's representation in, in Congress, in the Senate, in the House, in state legislatures, in judgeships, um, in positions of power in general. Um, uh, we are much behind many other countries uh, in the world. And um, it's, I, again, I think it, it's very particular to, and, and again, then you have to look at this from the point of view of also the racial dynamics involved. So um, more white women have gained entree into certain mm, places of power, like Pelosi, for example, whom I'm not, for, I'm, not, I'm not blaming her for that. I'm just saying she's an example of this. Whereas um, for black women or for uh, women of color, Latinx women, Latino women and so forth, it can be much more difficult uh, for them to gain into positions of uh, power and authority. Um, and um, I just think that uh, male supremacy, here's what I'm trying to say, because I think male supremacy is so intertwined with racial supremacy, with white supremacy, which is a particular way in which our history is manifested, I think that has affected how much we've been able to make progress in terms of women in general being able to uh, be um, uh, in positions of authority in the country in general. And, um, you know, the statistics are better than they were in my, when I was young, but we have a long way to go. And I think in other countries like New Zealand, like Germany, and so forth, they have their own histories, um, but, but they don't have that endemic, um, entrenched slavery and what it did to this country and still doing to this country. Thank you. I think we can fit in one more question. Um, this is the note about Mabel being invited to join the Honor Guard in 1912. Were there other women of color invited for that recognition? That again is a wonderful, wonderful question. And I, I don't know. I can't answer that. Um, I know that when Ida B. Wells uh, went to march in 1913, um, they, she was you know the um, she was originally excluded from the march because some of the si southern white delegations in the march objected to it, and I know that the women, white women in the Chicago delegation, simply pulled her into the line of march. They saw her on the side and they just pulled her into the line of march with them. And I know that um, Mary Church Terrell marched in the uh, suffrage parades and so forth. And I expect that other black women did as well. But I don't think in that honorary position that uh, Mabel uh, Pinhua Lee did. Um, not that I know of, but I could be really wrong about this. So don't, 
I'm other people, maybe in better authority, <laughs> would have a better no knowledge of this. All right, thank you so much. Um, and I will hand this over to Anne, is that right? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oh, Aptiker. I just would like to thank everybody for, uh, for their participation today. Those were terrific questions. And thank you, Kate, for moderating. You did a great job. So that's all the time we have. Thank you for staying over, Dr. Aptiker, to answer those questions. They were really interesting. And just a reminder that the recording of this event will be available on the library's YouTube, Vimeo, and website pages. And for other wonderful events like this, please go to library.sjsu.edu forward slash events. And to keep up to date with all these events, you can also follow us on social media. We have Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter accounts. I hope to see you all at our future events. Thank you again, everybody and everyone behind the scenes and have a wonderful rest of the evening. Thanks. Thank you.